Dry ice is an amazing material. It doesn't melt in liquids, but it generates a dense mist upon contact with water. It can instantly freeze a strawberry, solidify a dessert in seconds, or preserve vaccines in perfect condition for weeks. Unlike the classic ice cubes we use at home, this special ice isn't made of water. It's made of carbon dioxide. When this gas is cooled and compressed until it solidifies, it takes the form of a white substance reminiscent of ordinary ice. Its main characteristic is unique. When heated, it does not pass through the liquid state. It skips this step and goes directly from the solid state to the gaseous state, a phenomenon that scientists call sublimation. Because it doesn't generate moisture when it evaporates, dry ice is highly sought after for preserving food and medicine. Its mysterious mist has become a staple of special effects at shows and events, and its physical and chemical properties are so useful that it's also used for deep industrial cleaning. But have you ever wondered how dry ice is produced on an industrial scale? In this video, we'll discover together how one of the most fascinating chemical compounds is manufactured and packaged in factories. Stay with me until the end. Dry ice was discovered by accident in 1835 by French chemist Adrien Jean-Pierre Tillorier. Tillorier was working with liquid carbon dioxide in a high-pressure container. When he opened the cylinder, some of the liquid evaporated very quickly, and what remained turned into a solid white mass, what we now call dry ice. Despite this early discovery, its practical use didn't really begin until about a century later. It was in the 1920s that chemical companies in the United States began producing and marketing dry ice. At that time, it was mainly used to preserve food during transport, especially meat and dairy products. Its strength was that it maintained a very low temperature without leaving water residue as ordinary ice would. During the Second World War, its role became even more important. Dry ice was used to preserve vaccines, medicines, and food supplies for troops contributing to medical and food logistics in times of conflict. What distinguishes dry ice from conventional ice is its direct solid gas behavior, sublimation, which prevents the formation of water and residue. Its extremely low temperature, around minus 78.5 degrees Celsius, makes it a preferred tool for refrigeration when conventional means are lacking. Its main function is to maintain materials at low temperatures where there is no refrigeration infrastructure. A notable example is the transport of organs for transplantation, such as the heart, which must remain at a very low temperature throughout their journey. Dry ice is also used to transport vaccines or any type of sensitive biological material. It's ideal for maintaining stable and safe thermal conditions. If you immerse dry ice in hot water, the carbon dioxide is released very quickly and creates a thick cloudiness, hence its spectacular special effects. But now let's look at how it's made. How do you get this otherworldly ice cream? It all starts with pure carbon dioxide, which is extracted and processed from various industrial sources. One common process is capturing CO2 from sugar fermentation during alcohol production in breweries and distilleries. This gas produced in large quantities is captured, purified, and then stored. Carbon dioxide can also be recovered as a byproduct during the synthesis of ammonia a major component of fertilizers, and is captured before being released into the atmosphere. Some refineries also release CO2 when converting hydrocarbons into fuels and chemicals. It is even possible to recover carbon dioxide from the combustion of fossil fuels in thermal power plants. But be careful, CO2 from these sources often contains impurities that must be removed to ensure safe quality for dry ice production. The first purification steps involve filtering out solid particles and removing coarse impurities using mechanical filters. The gas then passes through scrubbers and other treatment systems where chemical compounds, vapors, and residual contaminants are removed. Once purified, the carbon dioxide is compressed to a pressure of about 15 bar, a pressure that corresponds to what one would feel about 150 meters deep under the sea. Under this high pressure, the CO2 is cooled to temperatures of around minus 20 to minus 30 degrees Celsius and then remains in a liquid state. In its liquid state, it becomes much easier to handle, transport, and store in specially designed tanks. The purified carbon dioxide is then stored in cryogenic tanks designed to withstand both high pressure and low temperatures. 
These tanks, often cylindrical and made of stainless steel to prevent corrosion, are equipped with valves and safety devices to prevent overpressure. They are maintained at sub-zero temperatures to limit CO2 evaporation. In some facilities, the total storage capacity can reach 2,600 tons of liquid carbon dioxide. From these tanks, liquid CO2 is transported by pipeline to the production units and specialized dry ice manufacturing machines. This is because carbon dioxide at high concentrations can be asphyxiating for workers. All facilities have continuous ventilation, alarm, and monitoring systems to control gas levels in the air and ensure operator safety. In the production machine, liquid CO2 is subjected to controlled decompression. The pressure is abruptly reduced to approximately five bar. This rapid reduction in pressure causes a sudden drop in temperature, resulting in the formation of carbon dioxide snow. During this expansion, the CO2 absorbs thermal energy from its surroundings and cools instantly. Some of it then becomes solid in the form of fine particles, known as dry ice, while another part becomes gaseous again and is evacuated through a ventilation system. The dry ice is deposited in a collection chamber inside the production machine. It accumulates as a white light, powdery powder, very similar to real snow. However, in its powdered state, it is not yet usable as solid dry ice. It needs to be compacted. To obtain solid blocks, the snow is transported to hydraulic fields that exert considerable pressure. Large quantities of CO2 snow are introduced into a rectangular mold. Then a hydraulic piston applies pressure of up to 300 bar. Under this stress, the snow particles bond together and form a compact and strong block. The block is thus formed at a temperature of approximately minus 78.5 degrees Celsius. It is then ejected from the mold and cut to the desired dimensions, according to customer requirements. Large blocks, smaller pieces, or pellets, small solid cylinders that are very practical for certain applications, can be produced. Pellets are generally manufactured in two common sizes, 16 millimeters in diameter for use in refrigeration and transport, and three millimeters for more specific uses, such as dry ice cleaning. To make pellets, CO2 snow is forced through an extruder equipped with perforated dyes. A mechanical piston forces the snow through the holes, and this pressure-driven shaping produces solid cylinders at the outlet. Depending on the diameter of the extruder's holes, pellets are obtained in sizes 16 millimeters or three millimeters. 16 millimeter pellets are often preferred for packaging and transporting low temperature products. The finer three millimeter pellets are used for dry ice blasting, also known as dry ice jetting, or as raw material for making larger blocks. After compaction, dry ice remains at an extremely low temperature of approximately minus 78 degrees Celsius and must be handled and stored in a suitable environment to prevent premature sublimation. Since carbon dioxide is both an expensive raw material and considered polluting in some contexts, industries seek to recover and recycle as much of the gas released during production as possible to reduce losses and environmental impact. Once production is complete, the blocks and pellets are transported by conveyor to the packaging area. At this point, laboratory checks are carried out. Weight, size, density, compaction, these are all factors that influence the product's strength and ability to resist fragmentation during transport. The product's purity is also analyzed to ensure it meets commercial quality standards. After passing these tests, the finished product is ready for storage and distribution. One of the main challenges associated with dry ice remains its transportation. Since it undergoes continuous sublimation, it tends to gradually disappear. To limit this loss, enormous insulated polystyrene boxes are used real portable glaciers, which act like refrigerators and limit the conversion of the solid into gas. The goal is to maintain temperature and minimize sublimation, which can be around 5 to 10% per day, depending on environmental conditions, ambient temperature, insulation, container opening, etc. The final product is therefore packaged in its thermal containers, ensuring its preservation before distribution to customers, sometimes on the other side of the world. Because dry ice reaches temperatures close to minus 78 degrees Celsius, it is generally not necessary to place its crates in electrical refrigeration systems. Dry ice remains cold and solid on its own, provided it is stored properly.
Dry ice is used in a wide variety of industries today. In the food industry, it ensures that food arrives frozen where it needs to be, from frozen products to perishable goods. In hospitals, it preserves vaccines, biological samples, and even organs intended for transplantation. In industry, pellets are used in cryogenic cleaning operations, allowing machines and molds to be stripped or cleaned without leaving chemical residue. And of course, in the entertainment world, dry ice produces the iconic fog that enhances shows, concerts, plays, and film productions. Thanks for staying here. If you enjoy this documentary, then don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you don't miss any of our content. But don't leave yet, that's not all. The rest of this video will be just as exciting, so stay with us until the end. There are stories so incredible that they make you want to listen until the very end without even realizing it. Among them, the story of the diamond stands out as a fascinating journey where nature and humanity meet. Each precious stone is not just a shiny jewel placed on a ring or displayed in a showcase, it is the trace of a journey that began billions of years ago in the very depths of our planet. By discovering this unique adventure together, you will understand why this mineral became far more than a simple luxury item. And believe me, what you are about to hear is worth following all the way to the very end. The highest price ever paid for a diamond exceeds $71 million. With such an amount, you could buy more than 10 luxury house, reserved for the global elite. Yet it is not only the price that makes this gem so extraordinary. It is its exceptional formation, its nearly unmatched hardness, and its history so deeply tied to that of humanity. A diamond is born in conditions that few things on Earth could ever withstand. Buried more than 200 kilometers beneath the Earth's crust, in a zone called a mantle, Carbon is subjected to pressures and temperatures so extreme that its structure transforms, giving birth to one of the strongest materials we know. Understand this, without that rare combination of pressure and heat, carbon does not become a diamond, but instead turns into simple graphite, the soft material in pencils. It is this rarity that gives the stone its immense value. After millions of years underground, some diamonds were pushed closer to the surface by ancient volcanic eruptions. They became trapped in special rocks, known as kimberlites. And that is where humans began their quest, searching the earth for treasures formed long before our species even existed. But before going any further, take just a second to do something simple that makes a huge difference. Hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. Why? Because what you are discovering here is only part of this extraordinary journey and by subscribing you'll be sure not to miss the next equally fascinating stories. Now that this is said, let's continue our journey into the heart of the diamond. The exploration begins long before the first blow of a pickaxe. Geologists use satellites, gravity sensors, and magnetic instruments to detect anomalies that might indicate the presence of deposits. Sometimes a single fragment of kimberlite found in sediments is enough to trigger a full expedition. When a site is confirmed, massive open pit mines are dug, carving huge spirals into the earth that can go down hundreds of meters. In other cases, when the diamonds lie too deep, underground mines are built. These tunnels descend up to 800 meters below ground, where heat and humidity make the work even more grueling. And yet, all this effort is for just a few tiny stones. On average, more than 250 tons of rock must be processed to obtain a single carat, a stone barely larger than the tip of a pencil. After the explosions that break the rock, blocks are transported to gigantic crushers capable of grinding even granite. But beware, despite their hardness, diamonds are also brittle, a poorly placed shock can shatter them into worthless fragments. That is why crushing force must be calibrated with extreme precision. Once the blocks are reduced to fragments, the next step is washing. Large rotating drums, high-pressure water jets, and vibrating screens clean away the mud and dust. The resulting material is called concentrated ore. This is where modern technology steps in. X-ray scanners detect the unique glow emitted by diamonds when exposed. In just a fraction of a second, 
a burst of compressed air ejects the gem from the rest of the flow. This method allows diamonds to be recovered with amazing precision and almost no loss. Then comes the sorting stage. Rough diamonds are classified by their size, shape, clarity, and color. Some will enrich luxury jewelry, others less perfect will be used in industrial tools where only their hardness matters. But for those destined to become jewels, the journey continues. Each stone is analyzed with 3D scanners revealing its internal flaws and the way it reflects light. Specialized software then calculates the best way to cut the stone. Sometimes a large diamond is divided into smaller ones to avoid flaws. Others, rare and pure, are left intact to become unique pieces. Cutting begins with powerful lasers, able to separate the stone along its most fragile lines without breaking it. Then, artisans use diamond-coated wheels to polish each facet. Only a diamond can polish a diamond. Every angle, every surface must be calculated with mathematical precision, because it is the perfect geometry of the facets that creates the famous sparkle. The process can take weeks, but the result is a jewel that shines with an intensity nothing else can imitate. Once polished, the diamond goes to specialized laboratories such as the GIA or the IGI. There it receives an official certification specifying its weight, color, clarity, and cut. A unique code is engraved with a laser on its girdle. This code, invisible to the naked eye, guarantees its authenticity on the world market. At this stage, the stone can finally join the jewelry workshops. There, prestigious houses such as Cartier, Tiffany, or Harry Winston craft the metal to create pieces that enhance the stone. A diamond is never alone, it is always accompanied by a setting shaped by human hands. But behind this dazzling side lies a darker reality. In certain regions of Africa, notably Sierra Leone, Angola, and the Central African Republic, men, women, and even children still mine diamonds by hand. In the mud without protection, sometimes under the control of armed groups, they dig for stones that will finance deadly conflicts. These stones are called blood diamonds, because they are paid for in human suffering. A jewel that can light up a glamorous evening sometimes hides a story of misery and violence. That is why traceability has become crucial. Knowing where a stone comes from allows us to choose not just an object of beauty, but also a more responsible symbol. And yet, the story of the diamond does not end there. Thanks to advances in science, it is now possible to create synthetic diamonds. With technologies like HPHD or CVD, researchers reproduce in laboratories the same conditions as in the Earth's mantle. The result is a stone identical in chemistry and appearance to a natural diamond. Some companies go even further by transforming the ashes of departed loved ones into commemorative diamonds. A moving blend of science and emotion that allows a memory to be kept forever. Thus, the diamond is both natural and now also human, a stone at the crossroads of two worlds. When you look at a diamond, you don't just see a jewel. You see a story that of the earth, that of humanity, that of a symbol we ourselves have filled with meaning. A decisive turning point came in 1947, when De Beers launched the famous phrase, a diamond is forever. That slogan was not just a marketing success, it transformed the world's perception of diamonds. Since then, offering a diamond ring has become a universal ritual associated with eternal love. Entire generations have grown up with the idea that a diamond was not just a stone but a promise. Even today, the fascination continues. Whether at international auctions, in luxury jewelry stores, or in laboratories creating the diamonds of the future, this stone retains its unique status. The diamond is at once natural and cultural, scientific and emotional, precious and sometimes controversial. It is this contrast that makes it so captivating. So the next time you see a diamond sparkle, remember it is the fruit of an incredible journey, from the burning depths of the earth to the cold light of a showcase. And that journey deserves to be known, because behind every sparkle lies a story that connects geology, science, art, and humanity. If you enjoyed this story and want to discover more, don't forget to hit like, subscribe, 
and activate the bell.